Hi everybody and welcome to a new exciting video in the Generating Sound with Neural Networks series. Last time we learned how to save our autoencoder object. Today it's time to load back our autoencoder in memory and then generate handwritten digits with our autoencoder. Then the other thing that we'll be doing is analyzing and discussing the limitations of autoencoders for generative tasks. Before we jump into the generation and the analysis of the results through the autoencoder, I want to give you a quick refresher about how we can generate data with autoencoders. So real quick, here we have a high level overview of an autoencoder. The first part of it is the encoder that gets in the data itself and it reduces it down into the bottleneck, which is this kind of like rectangle here. And then the decoder part is responsible for reconstructing uh, the data starting from its latent space representation. Okay, so what we've done so far uh, with uh, the MNIST dataset is basically like piping uh, handwritten digits uh, into the autoencoder and then the autoencoder uh, basically recreates that uh, data uh, into like the bottleneck itself. So it represents it, for example, as a point into a two dimensional space. And by the way, we have an autoencoder with a bottleneck with two dimensions. And then the decoder uses that information, so that point in the bottleneck, to reconstruct, hopefully, as faithfully as possible, the initial data point. Okay. So we can add like more data like this and each uh, sample is going to be represented by a point in the bottleneck like this. Okay, so now we have all of our uh, data represented in the bottleneck. Now what we can do is sample a point in the latent space or the bottleneck and pass it through the decoder. Once we do this, we hopefully are going to generate a new piece of data that has never been seen before. Okay, so this is like the high level overview of how we generate stuff with autoencoders. Uh, now, uh, if you want to get uh, more details about this, I have like a video, a previous video that you guys should have watched uh, in this series that goes into this, into like more detail. Okay, so this is like the refresher. Now, let's move on to generation itself. Here we are in the code. Last time we finalized this train script and so we train the autoencoder and then we save it. Now, one thing that I did differently from the previous video is that I run a uh, training with 10,000 samples instead of like the, the, the few thousands or hundreds that we've used last time. And this is just because I want the autoencoder, like, I mean, to learn like a better representation of the MNIST dataset. So you should run like this uh, as well if you want to kind of like follow all the stuff that I'm doing here. Okay. Then, of course, we have like our autoencoder class here and we worked on this like multiple videos throughout the series. And now what I've done is adding a new script called analysis.py. Now, here you'll see that I already have a few uh, functions here and these are utility functions. I'm not going to get into the details of this because we can think of this as yeah plugins really. So we're just going to use them. It's nothing like super important from a um, business logic point of view, but rather it's just like uh, stuff that we use like to select images or to uh, just create some plots. So we're going to be using them uh, just as they are. Okay, now uh, what I want to do here is create a if name is equal to main. So here we'll start our script. So what should we do here? Well, we should do a couple of things. So the first one is just to load the autoencoder back. And remember, this is saved in this um, folder here. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, first we need to import autoencoder. So we'll do from uh, autoencoder, we'll import the autoencoder class like this. Okay. So here we'll do autoencoder is equal to autoencoder. So here we'll call our um, load class method called on the autoencoder uh, class. And here we need to pass in 
the, as an argument, the folder where we stored the model itself, which we know is a model like this. Okay, so now uh, the next thing that I want to do is load the MNIST dataset. And now if you guys remember from, I don't know, a couple of videos ago, perhaps we uh, created a function that's called load MNIST, and this is in train.py. So we can just uh, import this load MNIST, okay? And let me just copy that tuple there. So we'll go back to analysis.py. We'll do a from train import load MNIST like this. Okay. So here we'll have x train, y train, x test, y test, and we'll do a load MNIST. Okay. So now. We've loaded the autoencoder and we've also loaded the MNIST dataset and divided it into like its train, uh, test sets and inputs and labels. What I want to do next is comparing the some original images with the reconstructed version of the very same image that went through the autoencoder. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing is we need some sample images. Okay, so here let's decide a number of, um, let's say, sample images to show. And we'll say that we want to take just like eight images and use that like for comparison reasons. Okay, so now the next thing is that we want to actually sample those uh, images. And so how can we do that? Well, we have a utility function here that I built. It's called select uh, images. And so I'll just get from select images, we take like a couple of things. So we take a back uh, sample images. So these are like the sampled images themselves and the sample labels or the digits in this case, like there are associated with those images. So now I'm not interested in the sample labels. We'll need that like for another plot, but for now I'll just use an underscore because I'm only interested in the sample images. And then I'll do a select images here. And uh, here, as you, as you can see, we should pass in the images themselves. And the images will be taken from xtest. Then the labels, and these are like the Y test. Oops, not that. Y test. And then we'll pass the number of sample images to show. Like this. Okay. So now we have a set, an array of images. So what we want to do is pass these images through the autoencoder and get back the reconstructed images. So how do we do that? Well, we need to create another method in our autoencoder class. And so I'm going to just like assume that we already have it. And so uh, I'll let me just like write this uh, expression here. So we'll do a uh, reconstructed images like this. And then I'm going to pass an underscore because like the method that you'll see in a moment uh, gives us back, returns a couple of um, uh, a couple of variables. So one is the reconstructed images and the other one will be the latent representations of these images. So here we'll do autoencoder uh, dot a reconstruct, reconstruct and we'll pass in the sample images. Okay. So as I said, we still don't have like this um, reconstruct method. So we'll need to build it uh, in a second, but let's assume for now that we already have it. So now let's move on to the final piece uh, of information that we need or uh, like to put in here to get back like this uh, plot with a comparison between the original and reconstructed images. And that's super simple because we have another function that I created that's called plot reconstructed images where uh, basically, I pass in the original images and the reconstructed images, and then uh, this function is going to use a uh, pyplot like, to create a nice plot where, like, you have like the mm, images compared like vertically, so up 
uh, like uh, on the top you'll have like the original images and on the bottom you'll have the reconstructed images. Okay, so let's use this and so we'll do a plot reconstructed images like this and we need to pass in the original images that are called in this case like the sample images and then the relative reconstructed images here. And yes, so this should be it for now. But as I said, what's missing here is the uh, reconstruct method and we have to implement it. So to do that, we need to go into the autoencoder class. Let's skip down to the last public method and then define a new method called reconstruct like this. This method accepts an argument that's images. So this is an array of images that we want to reconstruct. Okay, so here we need to do a couple of things. So first we need to use the encoder part of the autoencoder for creating a latent representation of the original images. And then we should pipe those latent representations into the decoder in order to get the reconstructed image or images. Let's do that. So here we'll have the latent representations and this will, will be given by self.encoder. Uh, and here we can use the predict method that is native to the Keras API. And that's because the encoder attribute here is a Keras model. So we can call predict on it. And as an argument, we should pass the images themselves. And so what, what this like method will do is basically like have the images going through the encoder and getting as an output the latent uh, representations of all of those images. Okay, so now the next step will be that of getting the reconstructed uh, images. And so how do we do that? Well, once again, we can use the predict method, but this time called on the other Keras model that we have in our autoencoder class, which is self.decoder. Okay, so we'll call the decoder here, and then we'll call predict on it, and we'll pass the latent representations. So basically we are, piping the later representa latent representations uh, into the decoder and we're getting like the uh, output and the output are the reconstructed images. And now just to finish off, what we want to do is to return uh, both the reconstructed images and the latent uh, representations like this. Okay, now let's go back to the anal analysis script. Let's run the analysis script to see how our autoencoder is doing generating handwritten digits. So we're running, hopefully we don't have any errors. Uh, yeah, we don't, great. So on the top part, we have the original images and we've sampled eight, okay. On the bottom side, we have the reconstruction of those images. So some of these reconstructions are fairly decent. For example, this one, this three here, this two, uh, this eight digit, that's almost an eight digit, and this zero digit. But this one, for example, is completely off, right? So the original uh, digit is a three, and here we have an eight. So how is that possible? Well, there are a couple of reasons. So first of all, I trained this model only on 10,000 samples instead of like the full 60,000 samples that we could use in the training set for MNIST. And so probably that has something to do with that. And But then like the main other reason is that if you guys remember here, I'm in the train uh, script, the architecture of our um, autoencoder has a bottleneck, a latent space dimension that's equal to two. So we are kind of like reducing down all of the complexity of the original data to only two dimensions. And probably this is too little, but we've done this so that we can actually visualize the latent space in a simple two dimensional plot. And that's what we'll be doing next. Now, 
If you want to have better results, better reconstructions, what you can do is just increase the latent space dimension to something like 10, 20, 30, something like that. And you'll see that the reconstruction will be way more efficient. Next, we want to visualize the learned representation in the latent space. How can we do that? Well, we're going to sample a few thousand uh, images from the MNIST dataset. We're going to pipe those images through the autoencoder, specifically the encoder part. We're going to get the relative latent representation of each of those sample images, and then we're going to plot them in a scatter plot. Okay, let's do that. So to speed up the process, I'm just going to copy paste this. And so now we are not going to have the number of sample images to show. We can call this number of, um, I don't know, like images, as simple as that. Okay, so here we want, say, 6,000 uh, images. So we'll pass this one here in the select images uh, function. And here we're going to get back uh, sample images as well as the sample labels and we need the labels this time and you'll see why in a second so here we get back the sample images and the relative labels or in other words the the associated uh, digits okay then we're gonna pass the sample images into autoencoder dot, uh, dot reconstruct but this time we don't want the reconstructed images we don't care that much about those rather what we care about is the latent representations so these are the coordinates in the two-dimensional bottleneck that we need to pass to a plotting function for creating the plot or the scatter plot with all of these dots in the bottleneck okay now the next thing that we want to do, and the final one, will be that of using not this uh, plotting function, but rather this other one here. And so this is called plot images encoded in a latent space. Okay, and here we should pass the latent representations and the sample labels. Okay, so we'll do a latent representations and the relative sample labels let's check out what this function does so plot images encoded in latent space so uh, this is quite straightforward so basically we create a scatter plot and now each point in the scatter plot is going to correspond to uh, the encoded version of a sample image and this encoded version is going to be a point that has two coordinates one for the x-axis and the other one for the y-axis because remember we have a two-dimensional latent space there's a final touch here which is that each um, point in the scatter plot is going to be assigned a color and we're going to have as many colors as the number of labels that we have or number of digits that we have in our images. So in other words, we're going to have 10 different colors. And this is going to be very uh, useful so that we can identify all the uh, points or all the images in the latent space that have the same digit or the same label just through their colors. Let's run the script and see if we can visualize the bottleneck. So the first thing is going to be the comparison between original and reconstructed um, digits. And that's fine. We already saw this. Let's move on and see if we see the... Oh, yes, we have the plot for the bottleneck. Okay, cool. So as you can see, we have like 10 different colors, like dots with uh, 10 different colors. Each color represents a certain digit and this is our bottleneck now here you see why we use the two-dimensional um, latent space so that we can easily visualize it now i want to draw your attention onto some features that we have within this plot that are somewhat problematic for generation the first issue is that the distribution of the data points in the bottleneck isn't necessarily symmetrical around the origin so let's analyze our example. So here we have, well, we don't have symmetry around the origin, right? Sometimes this uh, asymmetry is even more skewed. So you don't have any, any level of symmetry at all with autoencoders. And what's the point 
uh, here. What's the problem, really? Well, the idea is that, uh, as we already uh, mentioned, that we, when we want to generate a new uh, data, what we do is we sample a dot within this bottleneck and then we pass it through the decoder. But the point here is that if we don't have a symmetry around the origin, we don't have any point of reference. So how do you actually uh, sample points or dots within the bottleneck uh, in order to pass them to the decoder. Well, there's really like n no way like of having like a way that makes sense because we don't have any point of reference there. The second issue is that some labels are represented over quite small areas, whereas others over large areas of the latent space. Let's check out our example to see if that's the case. Okay, so now let's focus on this purple dot here. So this is, these are like spread out across like a quite large area. And these, of course, they all belong to the very same label or digit. Okay, probably it's is zero, right? Now, let's take a look at this green dots down here. So they are spread out across a quite small area compared to the purple one here. So what's the problem with that? Well, the idea is that when we generate new data, what we want to do is having a chance of generating like different types of uh, data or different labels with like the same probability. Now, if you have like very different uh, areas like that are where like this, like labels are spread upon. Well, the problem is that you're going to have lack of diversity. In other words, you're going to tend if you randomly sample uh, data points like from uh, the bottleneck, well, it's you have a way higher likelihood of getting like digits that corresponds like to these uh, purple dots rather than to the green dots, right? Just because the area is way smaller for the green dots. Okay, so this is like another problem that we have when we use vanilla autoencoders for generation. There's a third and final problem that we have for generation with autoencoders, and that is that there are gaps between colored points. Let's see if that's the case. Okay, so here, for example, we have this purple uh, dots, this area with all purple dots, and here we have an area with all uh, bluish dots. Now, between these two areas, well, there are no dots at all, right? So what happens if you sample a dot within uh, this empty area? Well, probably what will happen is that the images that will be generated from those dots will be uh, yeah, poorly formed. And these are the three main problems that we have when we use vanilla autoencoders for generation tasks. So the plot isn't symmetrical around the origin. There is difference in the areas where different labels are spread upon in the bottleneck. And then there are gaps between different labels in the latent space itself. So how do we solve these issues? Well, this is where and when variational autoencoders enter the game. So as we'll see in the next video, variational autoencoders are an improvement on vanilla autoencoders. So in order to learn more about that, stay tuned for next video where we'll dig into the theory and the intuition of variational autoencoders. Okay, so that's all for today. I hope you enjoyed this video. If that's the case, please remember to uh, leave a like. And if you're not subscribed to the Sound of AI channel, consider doing so. I'll see you next time. Cheers.